56 years ago, Martin Luther King Jr. published a collection of sermons entitled The Strength to Love. It's a very small volume, and Dr. King challenged Christians to connect their faith to action, which would result in just laws for all the people. Those sermons are as relevant today as they were when he first preached them. This foundation of racial unity and therefore justice for all in the love of God and recognition that God created us all from the same substance and that God wants us to behave towards one another with love and fellowship and with tolerance and righteousness. Over the last 50 or 60 or 70 years, we members of the white mainstream churches thought that we have made so much progress in racial equality in the United States. In the first 19 years of the 21st century, our nation is still confronted with bitterness, racial profiling, racial disparity, and just out and out blatant racism. When Barack Obama was elected president, a lot of us thought, yay, racism's finally defeated. A black man's in the Oval Office. Oh, that wrong, wrong, wrong. It brought back racism in a way and to the forefront that we never could have imagined. And it's only gotten worse since. But racism isn't a new thing. Racism happened at the time of Jesus. I'm going to read part of a story that you all could probably say most of it by heart. It's the story of the woman at the well. But I'm not going to get into that part of the story. But I want to read the first nine verses. Hear these words. Now when Jesus had learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John. Although it wasn't Jesus himself who was doing the baptizing, his disciples did that. But he left Judea and started back to Galilee. <coughs> but he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. And a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy food, and the Samaritan woman said back to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews did not share things in common with Samaritans. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Now, we can all finish that story, and I've preached on that story a number of times. But we need to look at racism that was happening at the time of Jesus. When it comes to the New Testament, we can see how strongly the racism existed between the Jews and the Gentiles. But it was primarily strong between the Jewish people and the people of Samaria. Of Samaria. Our text said that Jews did not share things in common with Samaritans, but other translations say the Jews did not associate with Samaritans. But the line I really want to look at this morning is the line in verse 4. I think it's verse 4. He had to go through Samaria. Now that's not really true. Most of the time, Jews walked miles and miles and miles out of the way to avoid, as my mother used to say, going on the wrong side of the tracks. You have to realize that my mother, not Lois, but my mother Anne, was a huge racist. And if you want to talk some more about that sometime, I'll, I'll go into that with you. But I want to go back to Jesus in Samaria. The scripture said he had to go to Samaria, through Samaria. He could have gone around, but he insisted that the way they were going to go was straight through Samaria. Jesus decided to leave his comfort zone 
It would have been much more comfortable to stick with the familiar route. It would have been much easier to only associate with people who were like him. Jesus already had enough problems with the Jewish religious leaders. He had enough problems without intentionally going out of his way to hang out with those people. But if Jesus had to leave his comfort zone, then maybe we need to do the same thing. When Nick, my son, who's 22 and married now, when he was two or three years old, we were sitting at a restaurant. I think it was an Olive Garden. Sherry and I had this discussion last night and couldn't remember. And we're sitting there having dinner, and he's in his little booster seat. And he points to a woman and says, look, Daddy, a black woman. And I went, oh, my God. Because, you know, kids at that age don't say anything quietly. And while I'm being horrified over here in my seat and Sherry's trying to crawl under the table, <laughs> he looks right back over at that same table and he goes, and look, a purple woman, too. <laughs> he was looking at their clothes. One was wearing a black blouse and the other one was wearing a purple one. He wasn't noticing the color of their skin. Now, we had done everything we could to try to show Nick that we don't treat anybody differently. But kids notice differences. They notice differences in the way people look. They, it's only natural to have questions about why is her skin color black and our skin color whatever this is. <laughs> It's how we respond to them when they see those differences. What type of comments we make, how we teach them that makes a difference. There's a song from the musical South Pacific that nearly derailed the whole debut of the musical. It was called, You've Got to Be Taught. And the producers didn't want to do it because they said it was too controversial. This was back, Daniel, what year was the South Pacific? Uh, mid 50s. Mid 50s. No, 49. So this is well beyond that court case you talked about. And they said, it's too controversial. We can't put that in the show. Leave that in the show. And Rodgers and Hammerstein said, yes, you will, or we're not doing any of it. So they reluctantly let them leave it in. I've asked Daniel to sing it for you, and when he does, I want you to listen to these lyrics and think for a moment about how you have been taught. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be carefully taught. You have to be taught the people your relatives hate. Isn't that true? People aren't born wanting to hate. They're taught that. Let me tell you about another story about another rabbi who lived, you know, 2,000 years after Jesus. This happened a number of years ago. And he broke down barriers and built bridges in order to shatter commonly held stereotypes, just like Jesus did. Rabbi Michael Weiser lived in Lincoln, Nebraska. And for more than three years, Larry Trapp, a self-proclaimed Nazi and Ku Klux 
Ku Klux Klansman directed a torrent of hate-filled mailings and phone calls towards him and towards his synagogue and towards many others in the community. He promoted white supremacy. He promoted anti-Semitism and other messages of prejudice, declaring his apartment the KKK state headquarters for Nebraska. And he claimed himself the Grand Dragon. His whole purpose in life seemed to be to spew out hate-ridden racial slurs against anyone who wasn't white like him. He made obscene remarks against Weiser and anybody else that wasn't like him. At first, the Weissers were so afraid that they locked their doors and worried themselves almost sick for the safety of their family. But one day, Rabbi Weiser found something out about Trapp, that he was a 42-year-old, clinically blind, double amputee. And he became convinced that Trapp's own physical helplessness was the source of his bitterness and his, his hate. So Rabbi Weiser did the unexpected. He left a message on Trapp's answering machine telling him another side of life, a life free of hatred and racism. Rabbi Weiser said, I probably called 10 times and left 10 messages before he finally picked up the phone and asked me why I was harassing him. He said, I said that I'd like to help him. I offered him a ride to the grocery store or a ride to the mall. Trapp was stunned. Disarmed by kindness and courtesy, he started thinking, and he later admitted through tears that he heard the rabbi, what he heard in the rabbi's voice was something he hadn't experienced in years. Love. Because of someone sharing love, the bitter man began to soften. And one night he called the Weissers and said he wanted out. He didn't know how. So they grabbed a bucket of fried chicken and took him dinner. But before long, they made a trade. In return for their love, he gave them the swastika rings and the hate tracks and the clan robes. And the same day that Trapp gave up his Ku Klux Klan recruiting job and dumped the rest of his propaganda in the trash, he confessed that they showed me so much love that I couldn't help but love them back. Communication. We have to love those who are different. The only way to change a hardcore racist is to communicate with them. The only way to change or understand what a person of different ethnicity feels is to communicate with them, to talk with them. Way back in seminary, I took a class called Love, Power, and Abuse. We explored relationships about abuse and power in relationships and dominant religion and cultural ideas and misconceptions and misconceptions of what love is. What I particularly remember about the class was working through a book called Learning to be White, Money, Race, and God in America. It was written by a black woman named Tandeka. Throughout the book, she helped us understand the history of race and racism in the United States and how the aristocratic um, people of the colonial times really set poor white people and poor black people, the indentured servants and the slaves, against one another because they figured out there were more of them than there were of the rich people. And you know, back then, if you didn't own land, if you weren't part of that aristocratic class, you couldn't vote, you couldn't do anything. The all men are created equal wasn't there yet. So she helped us understand this tension of race in America. About the same time, I was having racial tensions in the, my high school vocal music class that I was teaching. 
you know, I knew I had to deal with it before it got out of control and we had major problems in the class. And so um, Tandeka in this book had, came, had given us an exercise on reality that we could do. And I thought, well, why not try it with my class? You know, we often refer to somebody like my black friend Teresa over there. But with our white friends, we just say, my friend Tom. So my students, who pretty much all trusted me and I, they knew that there was an issue, agreed to this little exercise. Everybody in my classroom, and only during my class period, had to use the phrases such as, my white friend Wanda, my Hispanic friend Maria, my white friend Jimmy. And if they didn't use those descriptions, every time they mentioned someone's name, I would stop them and we would go back until they did. Now we did this for several weeks. Everyone in the classroom was called by their race or skin color. And by the end of these few weeks, my white students figured out how awkward that really was. We spent a great deal of time in discussion. Would somebody go let Rich in? We spent a great deal of time in discussion about race. Now, that's not something that can happen unless you find a relationship with somebody and you can trust them. Um, A few years ago, when Teresa's husband passed, she asked me if I would give the prayer at the service. Well, my prayers are pretty square. And so I have a friend who is an African-American woman who's a minister in Texas. And I called her and I said, Marilyn, I've been asked to give this prayer and I don't want to go in there and give a very formal prayer. But I also don't want to go in there and make a mockery of anything. And she said, I'm glad you called. She said, here's the name of a black preacher. And he is known for his prayers. And you go find one of his prayers that is meaningful for the moment. And then as you get up, you say, this prayer is by so-and-so, and I'm using it today to honor. And so I did. And I prayed it in my own way. I didn't try to sound like a black preacher. I prayed it in my own way. But in some ways, I think it helped between the two. Now, Teresa could tell me I'm crazy, but... <laughs> but, you know, I was trying. So... These type of things where you can have communication with others that you trust to help you do the right things and say the right things. You know, this whole thing we did with my students, helping them understand each other, um, doesn't really work if you don't have that communication. I posted this morning on my, on my Facebook page that I was preaching about racism and white privilege this morning. Now, I'd never heard of the word white privilege before a few years ago. But these things that I did with my high school class helped me understand what that meant. So this morning I, sent, I put that on my face and one of my college friends who is a professor at Friends University, she's an art professor, said, John, I read what you said you were preaching about this morning. A friend of mine who is a Native American painter presented yesterday at Friends University. He told a story where he was getting dressed for a powwow with some other men, and they were just, you know, getting all of their regalia on. And this little white boy came by with his parents, six years old probably, comes walking by, and the little boy, boy starts waving, Hi, Indians! Hi, Indians! And so one of the men waved back and said, hi, little white boy. Hi, little white boy. And the mother got ticked off 
because she couldn't believe how rude they were being to her son. So that little exercise doesn't work if you don't have communication. But it does tell us something about what people think. It's okay to call somebody an Indian or other words. It worked in my classroom because we had a relationship with one another. And we did it over a period of time, not in a moment. Towards the end of that school year, four of my African-American female students, their names were Loria Jackson, Asha Jackson, Jamie Mall, and Heather Moore. They were great kids. And they had formed an a cappella singing group that I helped, you know, encourage. And they sang some of the most beautiful harmonies you have ever heard in your life. And so for my final project for this seminary class, it was a project on racism because I'd been doing this in my classroom and I wanted to document part of that and talk about it. And so I asked the four of them if they would come to class with me. And they, you know, they didn't drop a beat. They said yes immediately. And we drove to Tulsa one Thursday evening. And for the first part, first 20 minutes of class, they sang to us and gave us a concert. And it was amazing. And then they got into four chairs. And then on the other side, there were 14 or 15 of us white people staring back at them. And we had a discussion about what it was like growing up black in rural Oklahoma. You know, this was the, this was the late 90s and, and early 2000s. Racism wasn't as bad, right? And the stories that they told would break your heart. And that's in a small town. You know, it was eye-opening how much there's still to do in this world. Things that we take for granted, these young women struggled with because of the color of their skin. We as a people of faith need to spend time understanding that deep down we're all the same all created in the image of God. But we have to understand that we're all different. We come from different cultures. We come from different races. We come from different understandings of who God is. I got into a conversation with um, a couple of my friends who are African-American preachers. And I have a problem in hymns and things with blood language because, you know, covered in blood, just mm. But they explained to me that for them, because of what their ancestors went through in the United States, that blood language is powerful because it helps them remember what their ancestors went through and that Jesus was willing to go through it too. We've been talking a lot about welcoming table. We are all the same. We are all welcome, but we, di we have different experiences. We can't say we understand what a person of color feels without having an open discussion about the different experiences they've had. Tom sang that black and white earlier, and it expresses the fact that Black and white is a beautiful sight. But there are racial problems in America. There are racial problems in Oklahoma and in Oklahoma City. I was at a city council meeting recently, I've been to a lot of them lately, that were discussing the northeast side of Oklahoma City. And Mayor David Holt, I really admire Mayor David Holt. He said the biggest problem 
is that in the past, the city council, mostly white, have listened to what the people of Northeast Oklahoma City have said and have said that they needed to help improve things in Northeast Oklahoma City. And then over and over and over again, this group of mostly white people said, no, what you really need is They haven't lived the experience, but they know what's best. We have to listen, but we also actually have to hear what people are saying and make it a true communication, not, well, I know you said that, but what you really need is, how's that any better than anything has ever been in the past? We have to have those in-depth discussions to understand our differences and our sameness. No matter who each of us are, we are called to love. Love God. Love neighbor. Called to live into our faith journey. Called to give of ourselves daily. Called to love all the people. We say that a lot around here. Jesus' proclamation that everyone is equal in the eyes of God, upset the cultural boundaries of his time. And you know what? It still upsets the cultural boundaries today. But he said it again and again that we are all one in Christ, equal in the eyes of God. That means that each one of us, no matter whether we're upper class or middle class or poor, whether we're homeless or housed, healthy or abused, educated or illiterate, straight or gay, black or white, we are all equal in the eyes of God. We are to be loved, we are to be respected as each other's brother and sister. And we have to find a way to listen to one another because the only ways that those racial divides are going to go away is when we care enough to learn about one another's sameness and we care enough about, to learn about one another's differences. It's not an easy thing to do, but we're called to try. We can't solve racism in America today. We can't even solve it in Oklahoma City. But we can start by making sure that there are absolutely no barriers at God's table. <coughs> because at God's table, everyone who's born, there's a place. Amen. <laughs>